friends. Oh, thank you. I don't really get to introduce myself. You all already know me, but I have a little bit of time at the end of the day. And I want to spend that time with you all. I want to talk about something that's important to me. I want to end on a very human note today. And I want to recap maybe some of the themes from our day, some of the ideas that we've discussed. And as we're revisiting those, I also want to get a little bit into what these might mean for us as leaders. And as we are looking at the evolving tool set that you all have heard so much about, I think it's important for us to take a moment and to think as leaders and as designers of a future about why it is that technology develops exponentially and how we can expect to develop it from here. And Jonathan Knowles talked a little bit about this this morning, but I want to take a little bit of a broader view and introduce you to an idea from Ray Kurzweil, co-founder of Singularity. He had the insight that technology develops in an evolutionary system, and that is a system that learns by trial and error. And Ray realized that any system that has an evolutionary process is characterized also by exponential growth. And what we saw was that technology basically builds itself almost organically out of itself, such that at each stage of technological development, you have the best results being used to create the next stage in that process, such that the most adaptive technologies, the fittest and the best, are propagated forward in the system. And we can see this if we look back at the history of technology and consider its future. This is a graph that's kind of famous that Ray Kurzweil produced some years back. And what you have here is kind of a, a snapshot of the history of technology. And I know it's reductive. It's obviously missing a lot of stuff. But what I want you to see is this. On one axis, you have time. On the other, you have population and millions. And you have a scatter plot of technological milestones. And for most of us, what we even think of as technology is all clustered to one side. It's all pretty much over on the right side, where there seems to be a whole lot happening all at once. Before that, you have things much more sporadic, much more gradually dispersed throughout history. It takes a long time to get to pottery. It takes a long time to get to writing. It takes a long time to get to mathematics and to get to physics. But as you're moving forward through human history, you're seeing what Michael Maltese called earlier combinatorial innovation, the idea of being able to take the previous generation's advances and now combining those to build something new and building technology on top of the previous wave of technology. And as we build and as we have more powerful tools and we are able to sustain larger systems, we have more innovators, and we are growing the community of solvers. We're giving them new tools with which to build new tools and with which to solve new challenges. And so that's why we see, as we're approaching the present day, you have a whole lot more people, you have a whole lot more innovators, and you have a whole lot more innovations. The rate of innovation, the rate of solution architecture itself is increasing, and it is increasing exponentially. And as we're getting into our present day, we're getting to a point where the tools of the innovator increasingly are digital, which makes them even easier to share. It makes it even easier for us to grow this community of solvers and to speed this process of technological development. So that is what brings us to a world where we find ourselves in a constantly evolving context. We find ourselves in a world that is always in the process of becoming something new where we're able to leverage intelligence and perhaps even creativity beyond the human to design the future. A world where applied AI and machine learning will increasingly drive innovation and discovery, and where perhaps today's crazy pace of change is actually the slowest that we're ever going to see. Well, so what does that mean in that world of accelerating change, a world where we are always new to it and it is new to us? I would argue it means that we have the opportunity and the imperative to become something new ourselves, to embark on a journey, a lifelong journey of continuous learning, to remake ourselves as the people 
the network and the problem solvers that this world needs us to be. So while we're always upgrading the tool set, we also need to make sure that we are upgrading the tool user. Jonathan talked this morning about the importance of developing an exponential mindset. That's a good and very important thing, but I think it's not the only mindset shift we're going to need. I think we also need to develop a growth mindset if we want to become what the future and the complex challenges of tomorrow will really need us to be. The idea of a growth mindset was first articulated by a Stanford professor named Carol Dweck, and her theory of mindset is basically this. She laid out two ideas. The fixed mindset, which is characterized by the belief that our talents and our abilities are innate. They are given. That we are who and what we are, and that's what we will be. Anytime you hear someone say, well, I can't dance, or I'm just not a math person, or I'm too old to learn how to code, that is the fixed mindset. On the other hand, she identified the growth mindset, characterized by the belief that our talents and our capabilities can be developed, that we can become who and what we need to be. She started by looking at children, looking at skill acquisition and development and problem-solving capability, and she found that success in those domains was highly correlated with the growth mindset, that those children who embraced the process of learning didn't mind struggling and failing if it got them closer to where they needed to be, they were much more likely to get there at the end of the day. And as she expanded her research and started to look at a lot of the outcomes that we consider to be success over the career and the adult life, those are also strongly correlated with the presence of the growth mindset. And the thing to think about in light of today's context, this exponential future, is this. As Professor Dweck wrote, the fixed mindset does not allow people the luxury of becoming. They already have to be. And if what we need in this world is to become, to free ourselves to become something new, then we need to embrace and develop a growth mindset. And we need to be able to adapt. So I want to introduce some adaptive practices, because I think that that is key to our future. And I use the word practices with a purpose here because these are things you have to do. And if you don't do, you don't learn. And if you don't learn, you don't change. And if you don't change, you can't adapt. And if you can't adapt, I think the future is not going to have much use for you as a leader. So let's consider a couple of these. And this is where it gets interactive, friends. So I hope you're sitting close to uh, some people that you're ready to interact with. So the first one, and we've been doing this all day, we need to leverage multiple perspectives. We are limited by our own experience, right? We need to get out of our own heads. We need to have our mental models, our assumptions, and our biases that are all based on our experience. We need to have those challenged. And a great way to do that is by making connections, by meeting and engaging in conversation and engaging in problem-solving dialogues with people who don't see the world as you do. In our exponential future, in a world of increasing complexity, it's going to be harder and harder for any individual to see the whole thing. So we need to engage with multiple perspectives. Like I said, that's what we're about to do. So I'm going to ask you this. How many of you are sitting next to a friend right now? Raise your hand. If you're sitting next to a friend, How many of you thought you were sitting next to a friend until the person next to you didn't raise their hand? (laughs) All right, well, I'm going to help you make some friends because I believe that this is critically important. And as we do that, we're going to engage in another adaptive practice. We're going to ask new and different questions. Do you remember earlier in the day, this really caught my ear, when Jason Dunn, who's doing incredible things, getting ready to build stuff in outer space, said that he really thought key to his process as an innovator was to ask different questions, right? And in an exponential future, you as a leader, you're not going to have all the answers. And that's long been an expectation that we've had for leadership. They're going to be the visionary. They're going to be the one with all the questions, or all the answers. Maybe the important thing is to learn to be the one who asks the best questions, the ones that will be the richest in guiding discovery, and then In doing so, you attract and enable people 
to come to you and work with you, and they will help you find the answers. So I want you to do this. I want you to turn to someone next to you, and I'm gonna give you about 90 seconds just to share a question that came to you and was new to you today, something that sparked your curiosity. What do you wanna learn more about? What's gonna stick with you based on today? What's gonna keep you up at night? What new and different questions are you asking yourself? So I'm serious. Please turn to that person who now will be your friend and thought partner and share a question, and they'll share theirs as well. All right, my friends. I hate to pull you away from your newfound partners in conversation and in problem solving, but I am contractually obligated to keep you moving and get us to that networking and cocktail hour. So if you can hear me, I will ask you to please raise both hands now, bring them together in a clap, Thank your partner for their attention and engagement. And let's keep moving. So that you don't think I'm just asking you to do this thing arbitrarily, I wanna share a new question that a friend and colleague and thought partner of mine from Singularity University, uh, my dear friend Lisa K. Solomon, has been asking a lot of groups in this kind of context and asking a lot of me, and it's this. She likes to ask, what does the future need? And I like this, I think this is a new and different question because it's not about what do I need. It's thinking from the perspective of the future that I want to create, of the preferred future. What does it need from me? What does it need from each of us? And how can I build towards that thing? I think another thing that we need to learn to do, another adaptive practice, is to work to see and think in systems. And we need to be able to see, and I think we've been working on this today, we need to be able to see the bigger picture. We need to think outside, not only of our own experience, but outside of our domain, outside of our sector, our organization, even our industry. We need to be engaging in these kinds of far-reaching conversations to see what is out there that I am not aware of. What is developing in the system that might pose either a risk of disruption to me or might afford me a new opportunity that I had not previously been aware of. I believe that systems thinking is essential for good design and also for accurately identifying both risks and opportunities. And for the risks of failing to embrace a systems perspective, there are dozens of examples. But here's one that I like. I don't know if this structure looks familiar to any of you. This is a famous one in the United States. This is the Disney Concert Hall in Los Angeles. It was designed by world-renowned architect Frank Geary, and it opened in 2003. And it looks pretty cool, right? You all are not impressed. You're like, no, we, we've seen great architecture. All right, well, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell you, when it debuted in 2003, uh, when it was completed, it was celebrated as a marvel of architecture and engineering and design. It was beautiful. It represented for many, it represented for many 
a high watermark in human creativity. This was something where we really capitalized on what we're able to do, what we can dream and what we can build. It was pretty awesome. But it also had some curved surfaces that were coated in polished panels that reflected the sun's light like a mirror. And in just the right conditions, at just the right time of year, in just the right time of day, those surfaces would focus the sun's rays and create something kind of like a very high-intensity solar oven that made almost like a death ray. <laughs> and there was a spot on the pavement that could reach about 60 degrees Celsius where that light was concentrated, where those rays were striking. So it was hot enough to burn hair, to melt plastic, the reflection could blind drivers, and the heat generated from this thing was actually raising the air conditioning and electric bill of neighboring apartments. <laughs> this was a problem. This is a design failure because someone failed to take into account the bigger picture to take the ecological view, to see how the design interacted with things outside of itself, to see the interrelationships. So those are the risks of doing it wrong, but I want to give you a moment to think about the opportunities in doing it right, how we can think about working within systems together and maybe discover some unexpected opportunities. So the way I want you to do that I have another activity for you. You probably get the idea that I like to play games and whatnot. So I want you to turn to another new friend, not the same one you just worked with, someone on your other side. And this time, I want the one of you who is on the right to think of a problem. I want you to think of a challenge, a big challenge for your community or your country. Person on the right, that's what you're thinking of. Now person on the left, I want you to think of a technology or a tool that you heard about today that really captured your imagination. And I want you to share that problem and that tool, and I want you to try to come up with a solution of how you might possibly use that tool to build something to make that problem less of a problem, to maybe make it a little bit better. I'm gonna give you 90 seconds to practice this with a neighbor. So find a problem, Find a possibility, create a solution. Work the system, friends. This could be your new business opportunity. All right, if you can hear me, please raise your right hand. And if you're looking at me, I know you can hear me. Please raise your right hand. Now use that right hand to give your thought partner a high five. This is a California thank you. All right, so 
I don't know how that went for you all. If you came up with a good business idea, uh, please know that I want to take equity in it because I kind of facilitated the exchange. If you didn't, I hope you at least had a chance to connect and to see what might happen when you bring two unexpected ideas together. Maybe you found a match. Maybe you didn't, but maybe you started to think about how this could build to become an adaptive practice. Now, I have one more. It's near and dear to my heart, and I think it's terribly important, and it's also fun, so I'm doing it last. And that's to create new narratives. There's a lot of power in narrative and story. Probably most of what you remember from today, most of what you take with you from this experience in this conference is going to be a story you heard an example that illustrated something for you. Um, and to think about the power of narrative, I want you to do something for me. This one's easy. I want you to watch a video that I'm about to play. Watch that video, it's short, so pay attention. And when it ends, I want you to turn to whichever one of your partners you liked better. You get to go back to the one you really enjoy now. And I want you to tell each other what happened in the video, okay? I'm gonna play it, you're gonna turn to a partner, you're gonna talk about what happened, and that's it, that's all I need you to do. So pay close attention, here we go. All right, now I want you to turn to your partner and very quickly tell each other what happened. Very quickly. All right, my friends. I saw a lot of you laughing, so I think I probably know where this is headed, but I'm going to ask you anyway. How many of you saw or heard from your partner on account of geometric shapes sliding around in two-dimensional space? Raise your hand if that's what you heard. Okay, maybe one. Now, how many of you heard about a conflict or jealousy or an argument, or maybe a love triangle, pun intended. How many of you heard about something with recognizable human emotions and even characters? Yeah, this is the way it always is. All right, in a word, what you heard from your partner and what you saw is a story. This is a famous social psychology experiment from the 1940s, it's called the heider Simmel experiment. And uh, originally, they performed it with, I think, about 35 subjects. They were students, and I believe 33 of that first 35 came back, and they told a story. 
about what happened. I've done this with thousands of people, and almost everyone, all of us, we see a story even where there is none. We project it out into the world because this is how we create meaning. This is how we understand our past, ourselves, how we understand our future. We are wired for story. And the scope of our possible futures is very much bounded and determined by the stories we tell and the narratives we inhabit. But many of those are no longer fit, they're no longer adaptive in our evolving context. So it's time to think about what new stories we want to tell, what new narratives we want to create. There's a management theorist and futurist named Christian Cruz who wrote an article a couple of years back called Killing the Official Future, where he said that basically every organization has an idea of what the world is gonna be like. That's the context they operate and design against. That is a story that they have told and retold about the future, about the world within which they operate. The problem is that far too often we leave those official futures up on the shelves. We don't take them down and ask new questions and make them respond to that evolving context. They get outdated and they're no longer very useful. So I want you, as we're thinking about wrapping this conversation to, and you all are very nice people, so don't kill the official future, just take it down and interrogate it and instead work to embrace the possible futures to think about all of the things that we might do, all of the futures that we might create, and to identify our preferred futures among them, and to find our partners in this room so that we can lead together towards that preferred future. With that, friends, I will say thank you. It has been a pleasure.